Hi, I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World, and a lot of you saw this week that the Professor Ursula Orr at Arizona State University uh, had a, a really unfortunate situation uh, with the police. Um, she was uh, slammed by, the, by an officer after uh, uh, a confrontation that really escalated out of control, a confrontation that some people think was unnecessary. Uh, the university has issued a couple statements about the situation, first saying that they felt the police acted appropriately and now saying they're going to investigate further. Um, I don't think they expected it to become as big as it has become, uh, but, but that's our job to really talk about what's happening uh, in our community with our people. So in order to dig deeper and to really figure out what's going on here and to understand different sides of this, uh, I reached out and, and, and got a chance to speak with uh, Ken Williams. Uh, Ken Williams uh, is, is a, uh, a former police officer who is also now an expert witness in many wrongful death trials. Uh, he runs K. Will Services Incorporated, and I'm going to let him tell you more about that in a second, but also uh, I want to start off by asking uh, Mr. Williams. How are you doing today, brother? Hey, how's it going now, sir? Going very well. Now, you um, you know, I know you're a former police officer, which which right there, that makes me have a lot of respect for you. My dad was a cop for 25 years, and I know how dangerous that job can be. And I insist on the fact that as people hold officers accountable, that they understand what a good officer, uh, a police officer looks like and that uh, that officers are not all bad people. Uh, and now, how many years did you did you serve on, on the police force? Where, where did you serve, if I may ask that? Certainly. Uh, Massachusetts, the city of Brockton. I was there for a little less than 20 years. I did uh, about 15 years homicide detective work uh, for the city of Brockton. Wow. Okay. So, so you you have extensive experience uh, as an officer, uh, and also you you've you've been a black man for a while, I assume. <laughs> and uh, and I so <laughs> and so so you're able to kind of look at this situation with Dr. Orr from from all the different perspectives. You you were able to look at the video and see. Uh, you know what the officer did, or at least based on the information that's available to the public, uh, how the officer might have proceeded, the options for the officer, and then you also understand as a person of color how racial profiling can sometimes lead to situations escalating out of control. Um, can you tell me, what were your thoughts when you saw this video? Well, uh, the video that I saw, there, there are two different videos that I've seen out there. There's a three-minute version, and then there's a more lengthier version, which is about five minutes. And the five-minute version has a lot of audio, maybe about two minutes worth of audio to it before the uh, the video is actually triggered. So um, if I can walk through the five-minute version, I think it's uh, you know very important to get the full breadth of spectrum of what occurred. Um, you, you have a doctor who apparently was in the roadway, possibly crossing the street. I'm not quite sure exactly uh, why the officer needed to stop her, but... He, he started citing a, a few different chapters and sections in Arizona law that I wanted to go and highlight because he said that she was obstructing traffic. Um, it's very difficult unless a person's in the roadway of vehicles traveling to and from different locations and they're physically obstructing traffic, then I suppose that might apply. But that didn't seem to apply to this situation. I didn't see where, uh, based on what I saw in the video... I didn't see where uh, Professor Orr was inebriated. I didn't see him trying to pose questions to her, uh, maybe under the community caretaker doctrine, to see if maybe she was inebriated and he was concerned about her, her welfare. I didn't see that. Um, the questions that he started asking her were very direct about her ID. And he started reciting Arizona law that if she refused to provide her ID, she would be subject to arrest. So to me, looking at it from a law enforcement eye, a citizen, a black citizen, uh, she was not free to leave. But yet and still, we had to look at what is occurring. This, was a, this wasn't a Terry stop where she was committing a crime or suspected of committing a crime. This was a non-criminal jaywalking, perhaps, citation, 30 bucks, see you later at worst, or in many instances, police officers, because they put on their helpful hats, they assist people. Do you need help crossing the road? And they help guide you across the road without being hit and struck by motorists. But this particular case is very, very interesting because the officer escalated this to what I think is a Terry stop, where he's demanding that she produce ID, he tells her that under Arizona law, if she fails to produce ID, she's subject to arrest, which is false. Because under ARS 13-2412A, 
under Arizona law, I'm going to read it. It basically says that um, in order to have a person produce ID physically to an officer, be compelled to produce an ID, you've got to have committed a crime under Terry Stop. And if you're suspected of committing a crime and the police are investigating a crime and they tell you produce the ID, it's because they're investigating a crime. In this particular case, because we're talking about a non-criminal, a civil citation issue, a, a traffic ticket, basically, uh, without a vehicle involved. She's not driving a vehicle, so there's no issue where she's got to produce an ID because she's physically driving a vehicle and there's some concern from, from, from that standpoint. Um, if we look at Terry and we eliminate Terry off the table because she wasn't suspected of committing a crime, the officer never says that he thought that she was suspected of committing a crime. So Terry's removed off the table. We have an officer that's imposing his will, abusing his authority, and he's making certain demands of this professor who identifies herself verbally, says, hey, I'm a professor. I work for you know the, uh, the, the university here. What else do you want, officer? I'm, I'm just walking down the road. I'm, I'm trying to get down here. And in front of her is an obstruction to the road where other people are crossing the road due to the obstruction. So I'm a little confused as to what escalated this in the eye and in the mind of the officer. And the only thing that seems to come up to me when I think about it is that he's citing the law improperly. He's detained her, and she is no longer free to leave at, on her own will, so she's seized. We have a Fourth Amendment violation that's taking place. And then at some point in time, when he starts demanding for her to produce ID, and she fails to produce the ID, which lawfully she can do that, she can say, I'm, I'm sorry, officer, I don't have ID, or uh, what's, you want my name and my information to check in a computer database? That's fine, I can give that to you. She did not have to produce an ID, and then when the officer physically restrained her, made it clear that she was no longer free to go and that she was going to be arrested, that escalated the situation out of control. That's what I see. Wow. You know, I'm, I'm literally taking notes as you, as you speak on this because uh, you, you've really identified some subtleties here that I think most people are missing. I mean, and, and I, I think that that's important because... You've got a lot of people who will have a knee-jerk reaction. Police officer slams black woman to the ground. Officer must be doing something wrong. Or a police officer uh, slams professor to the ground. <laughs> then that's a, that's a double whammy. I mean, right right there in your neck of the woods, you had the Henry Louis Gates situation, which I'd sure. love off the record to talk to you about that at some point as well. Um, and and my position has always been, you know, we have to take the time to really look at the procedure, look at Look, look at what you know what's morally right and then look at also what's legally right because legality and morality are not the same thing sometimes the law is, is stacked in a way that's that's harmful to citizens we know that uh, and we know that officers can abuse their authority but it sounds to me like uh, like it, what you're concluding here is that the officer uh, deserves the preponderance of the responsibility for making this situation into something that it didn't need to be that yes. you mentioned he was citing the law improperly uh, he, he violated her fourth amendment rights uh, she didn't have to produce an ID. And then, really, it, it, it's, it's interesting because I almost – and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong on this, but, you know, I read that the guy was a rookie, a rookie cop. And I'm wondering, do you think that this was a case also of just overzealous policing by a young officer who didn't know what the heck he was doing? Because I'm thinking, look, you're, you're an Arizona State University cop, and you're talking to an Arizona, Arizona State University professor. You know, I mean, you know, you're not talking to somebody that, 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 that well, you don't know who they are. They could have come from the community. You're talking to somebody who works for the university that you work for, too. This is a co-worker, practically. And, and, right. But yet you feel somehow that because she's not going along with what you're saying and she's not drunk, she, she hasn't done anything to harm me physically, she hasn't, hasn't broken any law other than what appears to be jaywalking, but you still feel that it's okay to slam this woman to the ground. I, it, it just it just seems like like overkill. Uh, so tell me, do you think this is maybe a rookie mistake made by a cop who just obviously didn't know know any better? What do you think? What, what are you chalking up to based on your experience as a, as a police officer? Here goes the problem with it. If it's if it's a rookie mistake, then we have a serious issue in Arizona's with respect to training of law enforcement. Because if it's a rookie mistake and he's fresh out of the academy, he is 
well versed and freshly trained. And he is well versed in, you know, the statutes and he's well versed in non criminal law. And he's he's citing different statutes and he's his application of, you know, that she was obstructing traffic and that uh, that's a misdemeanor in the state of Arizona. He's he's citing the fact that um, I'm going to give you a chapter and section in Arizona. 13-2412, refusing to provide truthful name when lawfully detained, uh, it states, uh, subsection A, it is unlawful for a person after being advised that the person's refusal to answer is unlawful to fail or refuse to state the person's truthful name on request uh, by, by a peace officer, right? Uh, it, it goes on, and in this, in this preamble, it, it starts to talk about how if a person has committed is committing or is about to commit a crime, then that person has no choice. They must provide an ID establishing their true identity to the police officer. So that's the reason why I'm saying if we remove Terry off the table, which this this section of the law is referring to, to Terry stop where there's a crime involved or reasonable suspicion of a crime, she's jaywalking. We're not talking about this is a... a, a, a um, you know, this is a serious offense or, you know, police are, uh, you know, stopping someone who um, is committing a crime or is about to commit a crime and they're trying to go and do something for public safety. She's in the middle of the road. She's not inebriated. She says to the officer directly, I'm a university professor and everybody walks down this section of the road because there's, there's construction going on. He doesn't seem to be focused on the, uh, the the common sense issue here, which is he has a citizen in front of him that is not inebriated. She, she doesn't need the community caretaker cap placed on because she's not drunk. She's not falling drunk in the middle of the road and you're in fear of her being ran over by a vehicle. That's not the situation here. Uh, the officer is very short with her. He keeps on telling her, give me your ID. Give me your ID. He's not trying to reason with her to go and how, figure out how to de-escalate the situation, he seems to be well intent on trying to escalate this and to the point where he tells her, I'll slam you on this car. Hmm. That right there makes no sense to me because legally, based on the legal terms of what he, based on what his position is legally, he doesn't have a Terry stop. He doesn't have uh, an inebriated person. Uh, at most, he has a jaywalking and that's a uh, non-criminal civil citation issue. And she doesn't have to produce ID for him to write a ticket. She's already offered to the officer who she is and wh what her status is at the university. Mm. Wow. So it sounds it sounds like it's a uh, it's it's pretty serious for the officer. It almost sounds like the <laughs> the the victim is becoming the victor, and the 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 perpetrator in this situation was the the guy who everybody thought was supposed to serve and protect. So let me ask you this. All right. So uh, digging into the, the, I guess, the political ramifications of this, uh, you know, the politics to me, I, I, I see played out in terms of the university's initial knee jerk support of the officer, uh, you know, based on the fact that they thought that somehow they concluded that he, he followed the law. And then you see the publicity grow, and, and you you see that people across the country are reacting to this. So now the university has issued another statement saying they're going to investigate a little more thoroughly. Also, you're talking about a professor. You're you're not talking about just a you know a regular citizen from the community, nor are you even talking about a student. You're not talking about someone who's breaking the law or inebriated. Uh, and it almost looks as though uh, there there are just so many ugly political spinoffs of this happening. Not to mention the fact that Arizona is a state that's known across the country for racial racial profiling, right? Uh, sure. In fact, you even go back uh, when President Obama was elected, that was the school, if I recall, that refused to give him an honorary doctorate, even though every other school was okay with that. Um, so I'm wondering, how, how do you think this plays out? Like, and I, I guess on two levels. One, how do you think it plays out for the officer in terms of his discipline or if he's disciplined at all or how this goes for him? But then also, how do you think it plays out politically in terms of how everything sort of settles in, in three or four weeks? Well, there, there are a couple things. I mean, I, I believe it's based on what I've seen in the video, and there's a, a news report that was released not too long ago where there's an attorney that's representing the professor. Um, I wasn't very impressed with the attorney that represents the professor because the points that we're raising, 
here were not points that were raised by her legal counsel, which I found uh, to be remarkable that she didn't look at the law in Arizona and say, my client well, wasn't, wasn't uh, committing a crime. My client uh, was simply walking down the road. She seemed to be, you know, taking the side of, well, my client is a very, uh, is a professor. She's, she's brilliant, yet still she found herself in this predicament. And that seemed to be the wrong, um, the wrong way to go and, you know, defend her client. But for the officer, uh, what I see happening is that uh, the ground swell is going to not go away because the, the, the validity of the arrest is not standing on firm ground. And because he can't articulate in a police report, he's got to have, he had to go and sign a police report stating what the facts were, which, which caused him to believe he had probable cause to arrest this lady. And in that police, the four corners of that document, once it gets over to a courthouse, I see the courthouse district attorney's office at some point saying, we're going to have to dismiss this because you had no legal reason to put your hands on her. And you certainly had no legal reason to tell her that you're going to slam her on a car. And then her reaction to being threatened by the officer is, at some point in time, she's wearing a short dress. She falls on the ground. All her privates are exposed to the world. It's a very embarrassing situation. We're talking about a professor whose name has been put out there now and has been you know, defamed. So there's going to have to be some action to correct this, and it, there's going to have to be an, an apology at some point in time by her employer who hired somebody that was supposed to protect and serve but failed. Hmm. Wow. You know, I, I think this is, um, this is interesting. I mean, th- these are so many you, you brought so many great perspectives to the table to help me understand uh, what's going on here. Um, I know my understanding has been deepened, and I think other people – uh, in fact, you, you should be you, you should be talking about this on CNN. Uh, it, it, I think it's only a matter of time, but I'm glad I found you first. Uh, assuming that you haven't been on CNN already, but I, I know that's going to happen one day. Uh, but I, I want to say thank you so much for all your insight, man. And um, and now that you've kind of laid it out the way you have, it, it almost it definitely sounds like she can stop. Be, she doesn't have to be on the defensive for very long, and it's time to go on the offensive and yeah. to, to talk about maybe filing lawsuits. Or it definitely demanding apologies, maybe demanding that uh, this officer be disciplined for what he did. Um, and, th- and then, oh, and actually, I forgot to ask you one tiny question. Um, you know, it's a big question, but it's a tiny one. Okay, so we know that that the officer didn't have the right to do a lot of what he did before she was slammed to the ground. But when she gets up off the ground and she kicks the officer in the shin, um, how does that play out? I mean. Is that then forgiven because of what the officer did before the, before the fact? Or are people going to say, well, that's still assaulting a police officer and you, you're still going to be held accountable for that? How does that work out? Well, I mean, her kicking the shin of the officer, um, you know, it, 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 can be, it can be perceived as, you know, this is a, an assault. This is a battery. Uh, but the, here goes the problem, though. Um, when you look at the totality of the entire spectrum of what occurred, and you look at the fact that her rights were violated. I mean, we're talking about under the Constitution, her rights were violated. She's telling the officer at some point in time before he puts his hands on her, look, why don't we have a respectful conversation? Why don't we take this down a couple notches? Why don't we try to resolve this amicably without you escalating this? And the officer is refusing to go and listen to her I believe, um, you know, it's, it's my belief that, let's say, for instance, I'm in uniform and I commit a wrong in that uniform. Um, that doesn't mean that the citizens necessarily have to take my abuse because I, I'm there to protect and serve citizens. But if I'm rogue, if I'm a person that's of criminal mind, criminal nature, and I'm given uh, you know, a certain amount of authority, a certain amount of trust, and I'm abusing that authority and abusing that trust and abusing the oath, at some point in time, a citizen's going to try to protect themselves. Mm. And in this particular case, um, that was just a natural knee-jerk reaction. I mean, she she was exposed to the world. God, it has to be very, very embarrassing for her in her position to have been treated like that. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. I mean, just uh, flat out humiliating. And I'm um, sorry she had to go through that. Uh, yeah. You you almost had to wonder. You you almost felt like okay, there's got to be more to this. <laughs> She's just jaywalking. Are you kidding me? Um, and I, I think that's where people can relate to what happened to this woman, because you're thinking, wait a minute, I jaywalk all the time, especially when there's a, an obstruction or keeping me from walking on the sidewalk. I mean, it, it, it's insane. Uh, well, I want to say thank you so much for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Doctor. And, and everybody, this this is uh, Ken Ken. Willis or Williams? Uh, Williams. Williams. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, this is Ken Williams. Uh, he is a former police officer. He's also uh, an expert witness in many wrongful death cases, and uh, his company is called K Will Services. Um, now, do you, does it have a website? It does. Uh, K Will Services dot com is is the easiest way to reach me. Okay. Well, I encourage you that if you if you need somebody on your side that knows what they're talking about, uh, you, you want to go to kwillservices.com. This, this, I've talked to this man several times, and uh, he's he's not only brilliant and well-trained, but uh, he cares about our community, and most importantly, he cares about the truth. So um, uh, so thank you, everybody, for checking this out. And I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World. Until we meet again, please stay strong, be blessed, and be educated. We are gone. Peace. <laughs>